then I want to be very fast. Okay, we were uh, starting on our regression expedition here and in the last hour we kind of ended up with the final model so to speak for a simple linear regression. Based now on this model, which inputs the y's, which are numbers, and the axis, which also are numbers, we want to construct a method which positions our line as good as possible to the observations we have. So the idea here is that we have these observations, they may be something like this, and of course we have a whole Inf infinite number of possible lines to draw here, don't we? We can draw as many as we like. We keep on drawing lines here, and suddenly one line seems to look to fit fairly good. But the question is how should we make the decision on which line to pick, so to speak, and then we use optimization, that's the idea. We want to fit the line which is closest to all points, so to speak. And we want to do it in such a way that these error terms aggregated are as small as possible. Then we kind of fit the line best. That's the idea. But before we do that, we need to understand a slight little thing. Suppose our observations look like this. They are completely distributed in equal distance to the line I draw now. Okay? So I have an epsilon 1 here. This epsilon 1 is exactly equal to this minus epsilon 1. This is negative, so when I put a minus for before it, I get the same one as here. And this epsilon 2 is, of course, exactly equal to minus epsilon 2. So if I add all these errors together, what do I get then? Then I get epsilon 1 minus epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 minus epsilon 2, which obviously is 0. So you see, I cannot use the total error here. I can't just add all the errors together, because then I risk the situation like this. So if I have a lot of observations on top of the line and a lot under the line, I could be tempted to put the line in between, because then I would get no error. And that's not necessarily what I want to do. So in order to get out of this problem, I need to do something with this sum of errors, basically. I cannot use that one. What I could do is, for instance, to do the following. I could add together the absolute value of the epsilons. If I do that, then I take out all negative signs and I will add all errors together. You see that? Then I, I kind of I get rid of this problem of this type. Alternatively, I could do this. I could square the errors. If I do that, I also achieve the, achieve the same effect, but I achieve another effect in addition, don't I? Because if I have some points here which are fairly close to the line, and one which is very far from the line, then this distance, when I square it, is much larger than the absolute value. So this method would try to avoid the big mistakes more than the small mistakes. In weather forecasting, that is probably good. Okay. You want to avoid forecasting silent weather when there is a hurricane. But you can accept a little bit rain. Okay? That is kind of what you do when you use these models. This one emphasizes all errors equally. So every error has the same value. So in principle, the situation, of course there is other options here, isn't it? We can use this one to the fourth or to the sixth or to whatever power, which is an even number, would kill the minus signs. That's what we need here. Or any function which produces a positive number out of a negative number and keeps a positive number would also do the trick. There are other functions that could do that. But basically, we typically choose between the two of these. And the reason why we almost always Pick this one, is the shape of this function. If we compare the absolute value function 
it looks like this while the square function looks like this okay and there is a problem with this absolute value function it has a point down here which do not have a derivative so it's a mathematical reason why we choose this one we can compute derivatives here in this case we cannot at least not in the normal way of course we can compute the derivative of the absolute value function but it has it has a what's it called it's it's not continuous at the, the zero point when we produce derivatives and that creates mathematical problems for the method which is typically used here so that is the reason why we to avoid the problem with positive and negative errors we add a function to get rid of the minuses and we typically choose this one not necessarily because it's best from a qualitative point of view but because it's much easier to handle mathematically but as I said it could be many situations where getting rid of the big errors is in a sense better than caring too much of the small errors so it in some people would say that this is kind of getting both plus kind of a win-win situation I, I'm not sure I agree fully but in some cases that could be the case but uh, the main argument is that it's mathematically convenient okay then we have the tools here now what we want to do as I said is to place our line such that the total aggregate error is as small as possible and the total aggregate error is now after my argument defined as the square of all errors added together this is the total squared error as it's called TSE now let's see here then there is this pure mathematics which in any case may be sensible to do here I think as you probably have limited experience with optimization in more than one variable because this is a two variable optimization problem isn't it you need to find two variables both a and b are variables in this problem okay okay so if we start with this equation we could isolate the error on one side to produce the squared error okay so we move this part to the left hand side and reverse everything meaning that epsilon one epsilon i is on the left hand side and then we get y i minus a plus b x i on the right side I did two things now didn't I first I put this one actually on the left side took that to no sorry kept this on the right side put moved this to the left hand side put the minus in front and then I just skipped it around to get epsilon y on the left hand side then I can take the square okay and then I want to add all these errors together given that there are small n observations I can form this function let me call it s 2 oab the squared error total which then could be written as the sum from i equals 1 to n o epsilon i squared or if I put in this one instead sum from i equals 1 to n o y i minus a plus b x i squared and when we do optimization we, we often do write a term in front of our function how do you want to minimize it or maximize it and if you write min we want to minimize it in this case we want to find the values in a and b which produces the smallest total squared error and often we tend to put our variables under this term to signal what we want to optimize on so even if it seems to be only letters here two of these letters are actually numbers now even though we don't see them the only unknown in this 
function is the A's and the B's, <coughs> or the A and the B, to be precise. There are no other constraints here. There are nothing which prevents us from for pricking any A and B. It could be that in certain cases, but we will not look at that, that for the moment. So then, as we learned yesterday, we can solve this type of problem by taking partial derivatives of our S function with respect to each of the variables A and B and equate that to zero. Of course, in principle, this function here could be very complex. It could be a whole myriad of mountains and valleys. We, we really don't know that, but you have to trust me that this problem here is very simple. It looks like this. Looks like a reverse cone. I'm not very good at drawing, but uh, something like this. So we're looking, aiming for this point. There are no, no other <coughs> stationary points that we need to bother with. So as long as we solve these two equations, we find this point. And we're guaranteed to find this point. This can, of course, be shown mathematically, but I don't think we need to spend time on that. There's something to do with what's referred to as a Hessian. Uh, do you know anything about linear algebra? No. OK, then we leave that. So. Uh, that is the case. So we just need to perform these operations on this function here. So let's do that. OK. Now, unless one are very experienced, it may be hard to take derivatives of these sums. So I suggest we just write it out before we take derivatives. I think that's easier to handle. So. If we take this sum and want to compute the partial derivative of this S2 of AB with respect to A, then uh, let me first write out the sum, I think. Maybe that's better. So I just write out this sum. I put start with i equals 1, then I get y1 minus a plus bx1 squared. Then I need to add the second term which is y2 minus a plus b x2 squared. And of course, it continues like this all the way up to small n. So there's a kind of unknown number, so to speak, here. But that doesn't really matter. Now I want to take this partial derivative. With respect to a, OK? Unfortunately, there is a kind of a square here, okay? It's a function which is squared. So in order to make this easy, I need to learn a new rule for, di for differentiation. So if you have a certain function that looks like this, u of x, let's say, which is squared, I can find the derivative here by taking the derivative as if this is a variable, like this, 2 times u of x to the power of 2 minus 1. I use the <coughs> normal rule. Treating this as a variable. But then I have to multiply with the derivative of the inner function. This is often referred to as the chain rule of differentiation. I, I'm fairly certain that Univision students have learned this one at some time. Ah, you're not sure. What about you, Tina? Mm -hmm. Have you learned this rule at some point in time? No. You haven't? OK. In general, it looks like this. If you have a function, which is a, another function of your variable, then what you do is you take the derivative of g of x, okay? And then you multiply it by the derivative of this g. This is the actual general rule. It's referred to as the chain rule. If you don't remember it or don't know it, of course, what you can do here is actually compute these square, can't you? You can say, OK, this is y1 minus a plus b x1 times y1 minus a plus b x1. And then you have to perform this multiplication. It's y1 squared minus y1 times, and so on, OK? And then you can take the, the, the derivative in a normal sense. But if you just believe me, it's uh, as simple as this, we just take this number, multiply it with 
the content. Let me just take this part out now. And then finally, you should take the derivative of the inner part here. And the variable is a. So we have a certain minus a here, don't we? And the derivative of minus a is minus 1. So we should multiply by minus 1. That is the derivative of the first part of the sum. And of course, you see that if we accept this derivative for the first part, it's obvious how the second part will be. You just substitute 1 with 2. It's the same, y2 minus a plus bx2. Again, multiply by minus 1. So you get like this. And it keeps on like this, doesn't it? Up to this small n. Or if you want to write it as a sum, you can do that. This plus 2 can be multiplied with a minus 1 to get a minus 2. This is the same for all parts of the sum, so it could be factorized outside. So you can write minus 2 in front, and then you have this sum here, which again goes from i equals 1 to n. O y i minus a plus b x i. So this is the first partial derivative with respect to the first variable a. Now we have con constructed one of our equations if we equate this one to zero. We need a second one as well, so we need to perform the partial derivative with respect to this b. Let's do that as well. Slightly more complex, but the same principle. <coughs> Again, we can use this chain rule to perform the differentiation. Then, write it up directly with respect to b. Again, of course, we have two times this expression. But now what's, what's it's changing here is the derivative inside. Because now we get a b times x1. So when we take the derivative with b as the variable and x as the constant, then x1 would be the result with a minus in front. Uh, we want to, we have a function now which looks like this, f of a equals minus b times x1, where this is the constant and this is the variable. Okay, I'm taking this outside the camera. This is just kind of Okay, and the derivative then obviously is minus x1, isn't it? And this, this is the variable and this is the constant. It's kind of confusing what is x and what is not, what's the variable, but in this case it's kind of reversed. So the small letter is the variable, and the big x is the constant. Okay, so we get, what do we get? We get the 2 times y i y1, we can take, start here, y1, minus a plus b x1. And of course, we, we use the rule by taking 2 minus 1 here, so we end up with a 1 in top here. And then we should multiply with the derivative over there, which is minus x1. Of course, similarly, it goes for number 2. It's 2 times y2 minus a plus b x2. Minus x2, again moving on like this, and we end up with the final sum, which could be written again by multiplying here, so we get the minus 2 in front, but the x's, they are changing as we move along with the subscript, okay? x1, x2, x3, so that cannot be put outside of the summation. i equals 1 to n, y i minus a plus b x i, times x i, okay? These two equations solves our problem. These are two equations in two unknowns, okay? It's an unknown a and an unknown b in each of the equations. So we need to be able to handle solving two equations in two unknowns. I assume you have learned that at some point, haven't you? You have seen equations like this, something like this. Do you know how to handle them? Yeah, 
the simplest way is to kind of use the first one to isolate one of the variables, put it into the second, then you get a single variable equation which can be solved. We use the same technique here. Okay. It's a little bit more complex, at least complex looking, but it's, it's the same principle. So, let's spend a little time on that. So let's keep this one and this one, okay? Just do it on top here. Maybe you should name them. Huh? Maybe that's a good idea. Let's call this one double I and this one I, so we can refer to them. Now what we want to do is to put this one equal to zero and this one equal to zero. Remember that you should always put the derivative equal to zero when we do optimization. Then we find these stationary points. So we do the same here. Then we can start doing stuff here. Uh, b -b -b <coughs> if we start with equation i, then we get rid of minus two. Can't we? We can just take that one out. If you multiply with minus a half on each side of the equation, we get a, a 1 here and it evaporates here. So we can always get rid of constants if it's equal to 0. So this one can be taken out immediately. And then we can take and partition our sum. So we have a sum here from i equals 1 to n of yi. Then we sum up this one. And then we can take the rest of the sum, which has a minus in front, and move to the right hand side. We, we have to let the sum run through all these elements. So what I'm doing now, I'm kind of partitioning, summing that one and summing that part, part by part. And as that one has a minus, I can put it on the right hand side of this equation, meaning that I end up here with the sum from i equals 1 to n o a. First I sum up the a, now it has, the minus has changed to a plus. And then I sum up this part later on. The b is a constant, so it can be put in front of the sum. Like this. Okay? This is alg algebra. I just change the expression here without changing the meaning. Just reformulating, if you like. So this is a, another way of writing what's here. Meaning exactly the same. Now I can do the same kind of operation on the second equation. Of course, then I have to multiply this x1 into the parentheses, so I get the yi times xi here. And here I get a plus bxi times xi. If I multiply the xi in, I get a times xi here, plus b times xi squared. Okay? So this is reformulated 1 reformulated number 2. Again, of course, I get rid of the minus 2 in the same manner, so I end up here then with the following result. xi times yi, xi times yi summed up. The first part, again I take the minus part, move to the right hand side. So I put the equal sign here, and I get the a times xi, which should be summed up. The a is a constant. like this. And of course, finally, a b times the sum to n o x i squared, due to the fact that we multiply x i by x i there. I'm doing it a bit fast, perhaps. So if you feel the urge to recreate my invention, of course, you're invited to do so. You might just do it in a bit more steps than I do. I used to kind of used did uh, two, two or three steps in once now to do it a little bit more efficient. Now what I want to do next is to make some changes in the notation. This may seem silly, but it's really not. Okay. So I do the following. Now I introduce the average. You know how to compute an average, don't you? If I have these numbers here, 1, 2, and 3, what is the average of these three numbers? 
It's two, yes? How do you find that, Vimanyu? One plus... One plus... Two plus... Two plus, two plus three. Divided by... Three. Yeah. That's how we compute an average. You see? We add the numbers together, divide by the number of numbers. So this is then five, six, divided by three, which is two. Which, by the way, is the number in between. So you could see that directly, if you know how to treat these averages. But we want to introduce the averages here. And of course, we can do the following. You can say that y bar, which is the average of y, equals 1 divided by the number of numbers times the sum from i equals 1 to n of y i, isn't it? If we write this as a fraction under or in front, it means the same. So this is the normal way of writing an average in at least probabilistic theory. Of course, this equation means that we can multiply on each side by n, can't we? So we can write it like this, n times y bar equals the sum. I'm just multiplying the n over on that side. Then I get this expression. And the reason why I want to do this is perhaps why I want to substitute this sum with this one here. Because so here you can see I have this sum of yi. So then I can use n times y bar instead for these sums. I want to get rid of these sums. They are kind of uh, annoying to my eyes. That's the reason why I do this. The same thing can be done with the x-bar. Again, multiplying over by n. Here, n times x-bar equals the sum i equals 1 to n o x i. Okay? So now I introduce this notation instead of some of the sums up here. This one can be taken out this one can be taken out, and this one can be taken out. I have to keep uh, this one, and this one, and this one I'll do a little bit else with. Okay? So let me write up the two equations again. Okay, I substitute n times y bar here, should equal the sum of the a's. So what is this sum of the a's? Okay, it's a plus a plus a plus a n times, isn't it? Can we write that differently? Yes, we can. It's n times a, isn't it? That's exactly what it says. n times a. a plus a plus a n times. So we can write n times a instead of that one. And we can substitute by b times n times x bar for this one. So we get a kind of nicer expression here. You see we get rid of all these big sigmas in the first equation. In the second one we don't get that far. We have to keep this one. But we can do something with this n times a times x bar, substituting this one, a, this is n times x bar, producing this term, plus b times the sum of these x squares. So this is the equations we will use to produce the final result. And what we want to do now, of course, is to solve these two equations into a norms with respect to a and b, which are the unknowns. So I use the method I devised previously. I take the first one, I, and solve for A in that one, giving me an expression including B, which I then can input for A here, producing then finally a single equation in one variable B, which can be solved. Okay, now we can take this out, I think. So, solving I with respect 
to A. Okay. Yeah. If we we see that we can isolate n times A on one side of the equation by moving that to the other side. So n times A equals n times y bar minus n b x bar. Now I've just changed this sequence of n and b here. That doesn't matter, does it? You know that 3 times 6 is 6 times 3, so we can circulate as we like here. And then of course I can get rid of the n's by reducing them. And I have directly an expression for this a. a equals y bar minus b times x bar. This one is then input it for a here to produce this single variable equation in b. So let's do that. It's kind of straightforward. We just put it in. Sum from i equals 1 to n x y i i equals n. How did I write it? I take the x in between here so I can have the a as a kind of single term n times x bar times this value for a, y bar minus b x bar. So what I did now was very simple. I just moved that x in front of the a here and entered the expression for a from star. Then I get this expression and I should perhaps not forget the final part which is this one. Now this is an equation in one, one unknown, the b. It's a b here and a b here. We have to kind of isolate this b to produce the final result. And we probably see here that if we multiply in here, we get one term here, one which is n times x bar times y bar. We got another term, n times x bar squared times b here. And we have a b here. So if we take this first part here, and move to the left hand side, then we get on the left hand side sum from i equals 1 to n x i y i minus n x bar y bar. You see we take this part, move to the left hand side, change the sign, keeping the equal sign. What remains here is one term including b with a minus in head in front of it another term including b with a plus in front of it. So I just interchange the sequence here and make that term the first. Then I can see a common factor of b here and within the parentheses I can put this part. And then of course subtract the remaining part here n b x bar squared. n b x bar squared. No, not the b. I've taken the b out, haven't I? Put it in front, so it shouldn't be a b there. It should be like this. And now it's straightforward, isn't it? We see the solution now. We just divide by this part, move it under here, and we get the value for b. So b becomes sum i equals 1 to n x i y i minus n x bar y bar divided by this expression sum from i equals 1 to n o x i squared minus n x bar squared. This is the final result for the value of b. And of course given star is straightforward compute the value of a as well, isn't it? Because now we have b here, we can enter it for b there to get the value for a. So if I just take this out now, I can put the A value directly opposite to the B value. This can be written out straightforwardly. A equals Y bar minus X bar times B, which is this expression. So 
this is our final result actually. This produces what we're looking for. Because given now two streams of numbers, x's and y's, we can input those numbers into these formulas to produce a b and i, an a, which actually defines the line we're looking for. Okay, if we have a and b, we can of course draw the line. So that solves the problem. And as, as I said previously, these values of e and by e and e, a and b minimizes this sum of squared errors. So this was a kind of lengthy argument, which perhaps is irrelevant in practical use because we normally have these available in computers to do for us without actually thinking about it at all. But at least now you have seen how we do this. This is the background for regression analysis. We can use the same technique if we expand the variables from one to several. It gets slightly more complex and you need to know some linear algebra, which you don't, but the principle is exactly the same. Same technique. It's a little bit more tricky to, to fix it up. But you get somewhat more complex formu formulas then for all these because then there is a B and an A and an A1 and an A2 and so on, which kind of, there are more of them. So the, the principle is the same. And of course, in principle, you can, if you have a pattern, which looks look li more like a different type of function, if you have observations like this, for instance, of course, you can put a non-straight line through them by picking another function. You have to specify it. It could be an exponential function or whatever quadratic function, the principle is exactly the same. Of course, the computations here will change. You get different formulas, the principle is the same. But as I said in practice, it's very seldom that you see nonlinear regression analysis done. Most regression analyses are done linearly, which kind of corresponds to this method here. Okay, maybe we should look at an example. I think we take a break now, so then we can move on with an example in the next hour, okay? Thank you for your attention so far.